Each week we plan worship and each week Kevin asked me the same question. He said, is that the sermon title you want? And I answer each week, yes. And then sometimes the sermon just changes. I don't know how that happens. <laughs> so, the sermon title, Kevin, for today is the call of God in your life, not the other one. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. The call of God to follow is a disruptive, disorderly, sometimes disturbing and always surprising, odd and mystical thing. It happens when two worldviews collide and a new one is formed. It happens when we are outside the main gate, listening in to the conversation of others just on the other side of the gate. And then while in the process of doing this rather strange and covert act, we overhear others speaking of something that speaks to us. We burst in as though it's about us, like some force is pulling us into discovery beyond all rational ability to stay outside and simply overhear. The call of God to follow comes when a core value, a deep belief, a consistent theme of our life story is touched on, hammered on, or heard anew for the first time. This call often supersedes our protests as the call's recipient. We sometimes run away from it, sometimes ignore it, sometimes openly and angrily and frightfully challenge God's call. But having received the still small voice of divine reassurances, we accept what is already planned and true in the heart and the mind of the Almighty. God's call often starts at the center of something old and emerges as something new. And interestingly enough, the call rarely comes at the beginning of our story, although the beginning, in the mind of God, has had the call written in it all the time. The call stories of God's prophets and other servants of God are very private, very individual matters yet so many of them are written down for all of us to read. For Isaiah, we hear the story in today's text. For Moses in Exodus, for Gideon in Judges, for Jeremiah and Ezekiel in the books that hold their names, for the disciples today in the Gospel of Luke by the seaside, on the boats, in the, in the time with Jesus, and for John's Gospel, we see this call story to Nicodemus in the dark of night. The call is direct, and then, when received, can more gently land with reassurances. And the resistance of those whose stories we read is not so much linked to their hard-headed personalities as it is to the overwhelmingly awesome experience of standing in the presence of God, a frightening reality. For the divinely chosen ones, it is part of the office part of the divine verification process to feel unworthy in one way or another. Today, Isaiah walks to the edge of the Holy of Holies. He stands just outside the gates of the temple and sees the six-winged seraphim gloriously present before him and the Ark of the Covenant passing by. He smells the smoke from the offering filling the whole house of the Lord. And Isaiah's woeful cry is like a confession of sin, an expression of mourning for himself and his people. He knows that he is unclean. He knows that he is not worthy to stand before God. And yet, with grace and with powerful gentleness, the seraphim, this huge winged creature, flies to him 
touches his lips with burning coals and cleanses him by word and by deed. And he pronounces Isaiah cleansed. He removes his guilt. He forgives his sin. And Isaiah is able to proclaim, here I am, send me. Now, I don't know about you, but all too many days, I feel a lot like Isaiah. Unworthy to do the will of God and certainly to speak the word of God. I feel like my unclean mouth is a reflection of my unclean heart. I do not feel that I am good enough or pure enough or honest enough or clean enough to speak on behalf of God about anything, anywhere, anytime. And in my heart, I pray that God would cleanse me. I don't need a six-winged seraphim. I'd be happy if a two-winged dove, or for that matter, maybe even just a little morning dove, would come down in a tree outside my house to say it's okay. Or maybe a child going by on a bike nodding would be a sign of cleansing. And in this winter weather on a sled. Just a sign, something, just something reliable. A human messenger who could say, you are clean, you are forgiven, you are redeemed. And I, I don't mean redeemable, I mean redeemed. You're okay. How about you? Can you relate to Isaiah in any way? It is often by listening in and overhearing the stories of others that this cleansing, this forgiveness, this redemption comes. It can come in a simple word of blessed assurance. It can come with a call from a friend or even someone you really don't know, but they reach out to you with a message you need to hear. It can come from someone you've struggled with mightily. It can come from a note in your mailbox, a text in your stream, an email coming to your phone or computer. It comes unexpectedly, and it comes just in time. It can come when a story of someone else's struggle with something else and someone else close to your life hits home. Someone who has faced and overcome cancer. Someone who has faced and overcome health challenges or a job loss or eating addictions, or drug addictions, or suicidal ideations. They have faced and overcome deep grief and anxiety and depression. It can come when you're feeling the full weight of caregiving and wondering if there's anyone there who's there just for you. And all of a sudden, that somebody shows up. It can come when you are stuck in your loneliness in your separation, in your alienation, and someone simply shows up. You overhear or experience healing. You overhear or experience grace. Through the crack in the wall, you encounter the transformation of faith and you feel the love of God. Like Isaiah standing outside the gate of the temple, witnessing miracles growing out of suffering, you feel a nudge just strong enough to push you inside the gate. And although you don't feel worthy, you do feel loved. And although you are overhearing stories of rebirth and the rekindling of God's gifts within you, when you hear God speak in the midst of it all, it is you who cries out this time. Here I am, send me. And whether you are sent or simply wander off like Don Quixote in search of windmills of salvation, you become hopeful that in your going, the direction you're heading will become clear. As you step out, as you move forward, as you mount your horse and head into battle with dragons and demons, it is as though those first steps of God's miracle begin to unfold the truth that you need to know. As the lips of the prophet are touched by burning coals of fire, we learn that the Spirit can touch our lips as well. As fishermen 
turn disciples drop their nets based on faith and hope and love and not their calculated knowledge of water and fish. That clearly didn't work. We learned that they too can drop our nets into, the, that we too can drop our nets into the water and trust that Christ will fill our lives to the brim. As you turn to Christ's table of grace, move into the days ahead, pay attention to God's call in your life. As you do, I invite you to carry this prayer with you, written by Thomas Merton in his spiritual classic, Thoughts in Solitude. The prayer calls all of us forward to a road that we do not know. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself, and the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you, and I hope that I have that desire in all that I'm doing. I hope that you will never do anything, that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may not know anything about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen.